Great. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call us to order, if I may. I'm Susan Reichley. I'm the assistant to the administrator at USAID for policy planning and learning, and I'm just thrilled uh, to see a full room, which I know uh, will get even fuller as the day goes on, to talk about an incredibly uh, interesting and important topic about Asian approaches to development cooperation. Uh, I'm also very pleased and want to thank uh, the Asia Foundation for co-hosting this event. Not just co-hosting it, but having it here in the Ronald Reagan Building makes it logistically a little easier for us. And, and uh, per personally thank David Arnold, the president of the Asia Foundation, for being here today. It's uh, just wonderful that he's taking time out of his busy schedule for this. Uh, and a topic that's really important to us and, and to the organizers of this event uh, both at the Asia Foundation and our donor engagement team uh, here at uh, the Policy Planning Learning Bureau who put a lot of time into this. It's not easy to pull an event together uh, like this, and particularly when we're really relying on development experts from Asia. And so our panelists today, particularly thanks to you for traveling such a long way uh, to be here to sh really share your expertise and your thinking on, on the rise of Asia, because I think we're at such a critical time, as President Obama really laid out in the State of the Union address uh, a couple months ago, about really our challenge, our challenge not just as a, as a country, but with our global partners to eliminate extreme poverty within a generation, within approximately two decades. That is a grand challenge, if there's ever a challenge. And so we need to learn from the experiences. And there's no better experience to learn from, in my opinion, than from the Asia experience. And what has contributed to their just rapid rise, their significant growth, um, and really changing dramatically uh, the complexion of their societies, not just in terms of economic growth, but in terms of equi equitable, or as President Obama has emphasized again and again in the policy uh, directive for global development and in all of his uh, speeches about broad-based economic growth, and that there are unique models and unique approaches to take uh, when, when really tackling these intractable problems. And the traditional approaches of just traditional aid, as we know, are very much outdated. And the Asian model really gives us an opportunity to look at how have they done it? How have they used that unique uh, combination of trade and aid and, and uh, innovation in order to really advance their societies? Um, here at home at USAID, you've probably heard about our new approaches as well that we've tried to take uh, to development because we recognize obviously that it has changed dramatically since the 1960s when overseas uh, development assistance was the primary source uh, in developing countries and looking at the opportunities to really partner, partner with the private sector, uh, really engage citizenry in, in really taking ownership of their own societies and looking at science, technology and innovation. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our administrator couldn't be here today because of budget hearings he has this week defending the budget, but one of the things he's going to be talking about is the importance of science, technology and innovation in order to really, really advance uh, our, our societies. As you saw the president yesterday at the White House hosting a science fair, if you will, because there are really unique opportunities as we partner, uh, partner in a different way. And the Asian experience really offers us, I think, an opportunity to learn from the partnerships, from the South-South cooperation, from the ways that you have engaged in order to really, really um, have this have this region uh, be, uh, be a model region for other parts of the world. So I look forward to today. I think it offers us an incredible opportunity. Uh, and I hope that uh, during the, the course of the morning, we'll have an opportunity so for also some real frank dialogue about what has worked, what hasn't worked, uh, in order to, for us to advance towards this incredible challenge that we all have before us of eliminating extreme poverty. And so on that note, I would like to pass the baton to my co-host, David Arnold, uh, from the Asia Foundation. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, uh, Assistant Administrator Reichley. We appreciate your making time to be with us, and we're very grateful to you and your USAID colleagues for hosting uh, this gathering. Uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of the Asia Foundation to welcome all of you to 
uh, this gathering and the opportunity for an in-depth discussion on uh, Asian uh, approaches to development cooperation. Um, as Susan's indicated, this is, uh, we're going to be hearing today from a, a group of distinguished experts, both academics and practitioners, uh, government uh, uh, administrators, on the approaches that they're taking to some of the major pressing development issues and challenges uh, that are facing us today. Uh, we'll be hearing from experts from China, India, Indonesia, Japan, and Korea on how they're approaching global development challenges as we approach the 2015 uh, benchmark year for the Millennium Development Goals. We in Asia find ourselves, obviously, in a very rapidly evolving development landscape, uh, a landscape with new uh, and emerging development needs, with new actors, and with diverse funding mechanisms. Asia hasn't always been the center of growth and dynamism, but it has become such a center uh, today. And what we're seeing is uh, a, um, an increasingly significant role for Asia not uh, moving from recipient to a donor and from um, um, the sort of focus of development assistance to being true development partners. And what has been termed now the Asian century, the international development community is in a critical juncture in terms of both the opportunities and needs that are created by Asia's incredible economic growth. And also for the need for all of us, both bilaterally and multilaterally, to re-examine what we mean by development effectiveness and how we understand each other's comparative advantage. It's my hope that today's discussion will help us move these critical conversations forward. I should say by way of background that this event is uh, building on the success of an ongoing dialogue series entitled Asian Approaches to Development Cooperation that's been jointly organized by the Asia Foundation and the Korea Development Institute and has been ongoing since December 2010. Our collaborative programs provided a forum for shared learning and policy recommendations on pressing development challenges from a range of established and emerging development actors. Earlier this month, we hosted a, a joint dialogue in Seoul on Asian approaches to climate change mitigation. And we're really delighted that Dr. Wonyuk Lim from KDI, whose leadership, whose intellectual vision and generous support has been integral to the success of the series. <clears throat> we're delighted that he's been our strong partner and ally in providing us with um, the support and the encouragement and the leadership in taking this uh, project forward. From the vantage point of the Asia Foundation, we see our involvement in emerging development challenges and evolving aid arch architecture as a logical outgrowth of our role as an on-the-ground development partner in Asia over nearly 60 years. Um, as many of you know, the Asia Foundation is a non-government international development organization. We're headquartered in San Francisco, and we operate through a network of 17 country offices throughout Asia, always working with local partners to help respond to the changing needs and priorities of each country and where we work. We look forward to broadened and deepened partnership with all of the development actors that are represented here uh, in fostering long-term discussion on international cooperation and development effectiveness. Let me close by expressing once again our deep thanks and appreciation to Ad Assistant Administrator Reikley, uh, all of their colleagues here at USAID for co-hosting this timely gathering, um, and also to Dr. Wenyuk Lim and KDI for their partnership and long-term support in this effort and finally, to UNDP and AUSAID for their support of this program in the U.S. Um, I also want to say a special word of thanks to our distinguished speakers and panelists for making, in many instances, long journeys uh, in order to be with us uh, for this symposium, and to all of you, of course, for joining us. We look forward to a very interesting and dynamic discussion. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Arnold, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, my name is Bonnie Hyuk Lim. I'm uh, from KDI and uh, have been working with the uh, Asia Foundation since December 2010 on this partnership called the uh, Asian Approaches to Development Cooperation. And going in, uh, I had a few, um, few concerns about global development dialogue at the time because at the time there seemed to be, and even now there is, uh, sort of a dichotomy between um, uh, donors and recipients. And also, I, I thought the global development agenda was too aid-centric. Um, let me explain um, uh, with, the, uh, with some uh, examples from Korea's own uh, development experience. Korea depended a lot on uh, uh, foreign assistance. In fact, back in the 1950s, uh, Korea drew about 8% of uh, its GDP, uh, G uh, gross uh, domestic product from uh, uh, foreign assistance, mostly uh, U.S. Uh, US assist assistance. But at the same time, uh, Korea uh, tried to share what it could with uh, other developing countries. So back in 1963, using funding from the uh, USAID, which is uh, co-hosting this event, Korea set up a technical training program for developing countries. And in 1965, it set up another uh, technical training program with its own fund. Okay. So there's a sense that uh, this you know, dichotomy of uh, recipients on the one hand and donors on the other is, uh, is too, sim uh, too simplified. In fact, no, no country may be too poor to uh, provide assistance and no, no country may be too rich to receive assistance when you are faced with, a, for instance, a humanitarian disaster like the, uh, the, the uh, Fukushima incident and so on. So going into uh, the uh, uh, Asian approaches development cooperation, I wanted to uh, provide some dynamic perspective on donor-recipient relationship. Because if you take a long you know, sweep of history, there, uh, there are no permanent donors and there are no permanent uh, recipients. And in addition, uh, drawing from the experience of Asian countries, which have, uh, happen to be the only region in the world that uh, reduced the development gap with advanced economies, I, uh, I, w I wanted to move the global development agenda forward beyond uh, uh, aid-centric notions. So if you look at uh, Asian experience, rapid shared growth or broad-based uh, growth, as, uh, as, as Susan uh, rightly just mentioned, is the key, uh, key part of, uh, key feature of uh, Asia's uh, development experience. And this, uh, uh, this rapid shared growth was uh, generated through uh, structural transformation and human resource development. And it wasn't just the uh, external infusion of aid that uh, catapulted these uh, Asian countries to uh, a, a higher stage of development. So instead of just focusing on basic human needs uh, met through the uh, uh, external infusion of aid, I wanted to uh, focus on issues that would uh, have something to do with structural transformation and human resource development, and that would lead to self-sustaining growth and development uh, that would in, in turn ensure human development for the long term. So uh, based on these considerations, uh, I worked with the uh, Asia F uh, Foundation partners, David Arnold, uh, Dr. Gordon Hine, uh, Vice President, as well as uh, Anthea Molokala, who's here uh, today. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Dr. Arnold mentioned, we had uh, a very nice uh, um, kickoff meeting in December 2010 and uh, uh, examined the uh, development cooperation policies of uh, core Asian, emerging Asian countries, uh, China, India, Indonesia, and so on, and uh, had a very nice uh, side meeting uh, at the HLF4, a uh, high-level forum on um, aid effectiveness in Busan uh, at the end of uh, 2011, and uh, followed that up with a uh, thematic uh, programs on uh, pro poor inclusive growth in 2012, and this year, as Dr. Arnold mentioned, we are looking at climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we hope uh, these um, Asian approaches, uh, it's not Asian Asian because other countries like Brazil and uh, uh, Germany also have knowledge intensive uh, structural uh, transformation oriented development cooperation approaches too. But I hope these uh, uh, Asian approaches, uh, so called, would have, uh, have an imp important impact on global uh, 
uh, development uh, policy dialogue. And I hope uh, the uh, partnership with the Asia Foundation, between the Asia Foundation and KDI will produce many successful events like, uh, like this in the future. And in closing, I'd like to thank uh, Susan Reichley, the uh, Assistant Administrator, and uh, David Arnold, uh, President of the uh, Asia Foundation for jointly hosting this event. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Good. My name is Gordon Hine. I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Asia Foundation. Uh, I'm based in our headquarters in San Francisco. It's my great pleasure to moderate the first of our two panels this morning. Uh, this one will be focused on development cooperation in the Asian century. On this panel, we'll have pres presentations from government officials representing four Asian countries that are providers of different types of uh, development cooperation. Uh, two of the countries, Japan and Korea, are of course uh, members of the OECD DAC, uh, while two others, uh, India and Indonesia, have important and growing programs uh, focused on South-South uh, development cooperation. Each of our uh, four panelists is uh, going to speak for 10 to 12 minutes, uh, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, questions and, and, and comments from, from, from all of you. Uh, so we'll go until uh, 10.30, and then we'll take a 15-minute coffee break. Uh, then we'll have a, a second panel uh, featuring uh, development policy specialists uh, from three Asian countries, Korea, China, and India. And the discussion there will be focused on uh, post-2015 development challenges. Uh, that panel will be moderated by, by Jennifer Adams, who's director of, do of the Donor Engagement Office here at, at USAID. Uh, and again, the, the panelists will speak for 10 or 12 minutes, and we'll uh, follow that with, uh, with uh, Q&A. Uh, then we'll have brief uh, closing remarks from, from Thomas Bailo of, uh, from UNDP. And we'll need to, uh, to evacuate the room uh, promptly at noon. Uh, I want to give you advance warning. Uh, is there, there's another uh, event here that needs to be, to be set up for. So for our first panel on development cooperation in the Asia, Asian century, we, we have a, a, a terrific group of presenters uh, lined up. You have their, their bios in front of you, so I'm not going to uh, provide uh, lengthy uh, descriptions of, of each of them. We'll just uh, get right, right into the presentations. Our, our first presenter is Ms. Anna Park, who's uh, Director General for Development Cooperation at the Korea Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, as many of you know, Director General Park was uh, served as the vice chair of the Working Party on Aid Effectiveness and was uh, really the main organizer for the high-level forum on, on aid effectiveness, uh, HLF4, in Busan in, uh, in November of uh, 2011. Uh, Madam Park, if I could invite you. Good morning. Thank you. My turn yes. to make presentations. Well, hey, good morning, everybody, distinguished guests. I'm very much pleased to be here. Um, let me first uh, express my uh, gratitude to um, 
Asia Foundation and the USAID for organizing such a wonderful event. Um, as one of the Korean, uh, as one of Asian uh, actors, uh, Korea has uh, uh, engaged in uh, a significant way in terms of the ODA provision and uh, um, global architecture building uh, processes. Uh, let me brief you on uh, Korea's development cooperation policy. My presentation uh, will uh, cover um, three uh, subjects, actually three parts. Uh, philosophy and objectives, second, uh, strategy one, and the third, um, strategy two. Well, uh, philosophy and objectives. Uh, before going to the philosophy, let me brief you on a uh, historical background. Uh, as Dr. Liam uh, just mentioned at his opening uh, remarks, uh, Korea uh, has been a recipient for uh, 55 years. Uh, uh, we have received uh, foreign aid, um, 12 billion dollars. Uh, uh, the current value is about the 60 billions uh, for uh, 55 years. While we received the foreign uh, aid, we also uh, provided uh, cooperation uh, to other developing countries. We set up uh, a concessional loan program in 87, and we, uh, set, we established the COICA, uh, Developed Cooperation Agency, in 91. Um, in uh, 1999, uh, we finally graduated from recipient list. Um, then in um, 2010, we joined OECD DAC. Um, so we are the first country who trans transformed itself from a recipient to OECD DAC member. Still, we are the only one, and we hope that uh, other countries uh, will be um, well, this is the second or third cases soon. Um, against the, this historic uh, background, Korea places uh, development cooperation as one of the main pillars of foreign policy, um, which is called contribution diplomacy. So contribution diplomacy is a main pillar of foreign policy on its own. Um, it's also an effective tool to support uh, other pillars of foreign policy like uh, uh, the public diplomacy, diplomacy for developing countries, and diplomacy with the people. What are the objectives of Korea's ODA policy? Uh, uh, the Framework Act on Development Cooperation enacted uh, in uh, 2010 when we joined OECD DAC. Um, it stipulates the main objectives of our development cooperation uh, as follows. Uh, to reduce poverty and improve the quality of life of people in developing countries. To support the development of developing nations. To promote friendly relations and mutual exchanges. And to contribute toward the resolution of global problems. Let's have a uh, um, glance. How much o uh, ODA? In the year 2011, the total ODA volume was 1.3 billion, uh, which uh, ranks us at the 17th out of 23 DANG members. And this year, we have a 2 uh, billion ODA budget. So. Uh, the volume is uh, still modest, but it's fast increased, very fastly increases. Uh, not only ODA uh, provision, we are also dispatching volunteers uh, uh, to developing countries, uh, uh, 4,000 people per year. It's, uh, we are the second largest volunteer sending uh, country right after United States. In terms of uh, volunteer population ratio, we are number one in the world. <laughs> so we are very much proud of that. Um, well, as you see, Korea is a still modest uh, donor, and uh, there is a lot of uh, challenges we face. Uh, well, the main uh, 
challenges are uh, the volume of ODA and uh, the quality of ODA. So we have uh, four tasks, uh, scaling up ODA, uh, enhancing AD effectiveness, improving implementation system, and strengthening policy coherence. <coughs> now uh, let's move uh, on uh, to create the strategies to realize uh, the goal of ODA, uh, which is making impact on development of partner countries through effective uh, uh, catalytic use of ODA. The first one is uh, uh, the sharing our development experience. As you see, uh, Korea has achieved a successful economic and social development uh, by effective uh, uh, utilization uh, of uh, foreign aid. The left uh, picture shows uh, um, a destroyed bridge over uh, the Han River at the break of the Korean War, and the right one, uh, it's uh, uh, the current, uh, today is Seoul. Uh, so it uh, demonstrates, it's a showcase of uh, our success. So Korea believes that uh, we have a strong potential to make a substantial contributions to uh, international community through sharing our experience and knowledge. Korea works to uh, make these experiences available for uh, partner countries. We strategically uh, selected 100 cases from eight sectors for documentation. Um, we believe that the, the selected cases could be uh, very good references for other uh, developing countries. In order to systematically uh, share uh, the experience and knowledge, uh, COICA has a knowledge-based program, which is called the DEEP program, Development Experience Exchange Partnership. Uh, this year, DEEP program uh, is going to conduct uh, 52 consulting projects for 28 uh, countries. Uh, besides the program, uh, we have a uh, uh, KSP, knowledge sharing program, conducted by KDI. Um, and in addition, we dispatch advisors uh, to uh, partner countries. Currently, we have 86 advisory experts working in 26 countries. Uh, we also work with uh, international organizations uh, to make our experience and knowledge available for other actors. Uh, UNDP uh, has a policy center in Seoul, um, which is playing a bridging role uh, and brokering uh, the knowledge demand and the knowledge supply. Uh, we are also supporting OECD Knowledge Sharing Alliance and we uh, look forward that uh, World Bank will establish an office uh, uh, in Seoul quite soon to uh, broker knowledge sharing. So uh, I have a few more minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> An example uh, to share our experience through international organizations is uh, World, uh, World Food, Food Programs uh, Project uh, in uh, Nepal, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Bangladesh. Uh, you know, Korea uh, has a very successful experience in rural development called the Semal Undong New Village Movement. So it is modified, reflecting partner countries' uh, specific uh, and the circumstances, and it is integrated in the World Food uh, Programs uh, project in those countries. And uh, it, we see these programs are very successful. Well, uh, the second strategy is strengthening global partnership. Korea is strengthening uh, partnership with other uh, donors, South-South cooperation providers, and the international organizations to make a synergy. Uh, for that purpose, uh, COICA has uh, concluded MOUs with other agencies, US, uh, OSAID, CIICA, and uh, USAID. And I am very glad to see COICA step seconded to USAID here today. And we also are very much uh, interested in 
triangular cooperation, uh, building partnership with the other South South cooperation provider like uh, uh, Chile, Peru, uh, Colombia, and uh, Turkey. Meanwhile, uh, Korea is also actively contributing to global development agenda. At the G20 summit uh, in Seoul, we introduced, uh, we initiated a development agenda as one of the main pillars of G20 activities. Um, the we successfully hosted a uh, high-level panel on aid effectiveness in Busan. Um, which is uh, truly a multi-stakeholders uh, gathering. Then uh, we are working uh, for the uh, successful first initial meeting to be held at the end of this year or early uh, next year. Then uh, we also s uh, contribute to uh, post-2015 processes as my former uh, Foreign Minister, which he, uh, who is a high-level panel member uh, on, uh, on uh, post-2015. So let me conclude my uh, remarks uh, by quoting uh, my uh, new president's uh, re remarks on uh, developed cooperation on uh, her inauguration day. I quote, I envision a Republic Korea to, that contributes not only to peace and prosperity, on the Korean Peninsula, but also uh, in Northeast Asia and the rest of the world. We, I believe it's now time to, for Republic Korea to reciprocate the help we received from the world. Uh, we will join hand with other aid partners to actively pursue the type of developed cooperation that sets an example for others. So, the end of quote, right? So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam, Madam Park. Uh, at, at a time when many donor countries are, are cutting back their, their levels of assistance and fighting hard to maintain their budget levels, it's very encouraging that Korea's ODA budget is continuing to expand and to expand uh, quite, quite dramatically. We, we, we all want to know the secret of that. Um, next, uh, we'll hear from, from, from Randir Jaswal, who's the counselor at India's permanent mission uh, to the United Nations in New York. Mr. Jaswal, please. Thank you, Gordon, and good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank uh, Asia Foundation and USAID for bringing us all here together uh, on what uh, to discuss the various approaches to development cooperation. Now, since I work at the United Nations, uh, where the questions of equity and inclusivity are very important, so I'll bring that sort of perspective in the narrative that I, uh, that I, that I give today. Uh, of course, India being an important uh, important uh, country which is playing an important role on the development side and development cooperation, we remain fully committed to post-2015 development agenda. And even, as, uh, even on the development agenda as it unfolds in this year and the year uh, coming uh, ahead. So, mm, uh, you know, what we see is there's a global uh, conversation going on on South-South cooperation and as to what sort of role it should play in the larger global landscape of development and development effectiveness. Now, in this understanding, what we see is that uh, people are not totally clued up with the moorings and genesis of South-South cooperation, because that is very important to keep in mind the identity and specificities of South-South cooperation. Now, obviously, at a time when s the salience of South-South cooperation is going on, we hear a lot more about what South should do, what South should not do, how South should do, etc. And therefore, it's little uh, if important for us to dwell uh, and spend some time to uh, to see as to how South-South uh, cooperation is a different paradigm. And it's important that this paradigm is given as much space as required and given uh, to grow within 
in, in accordance with its own principles. Uh, you would all uh, appreciate that South-South cooperation, that is cooperation between developing countries, was born in a particular historical context. And this South-South cooperation was a logical extension of that shared solidarity that developing countries had in the decades of 50s and 60s. Uh, it was India's own development cooperation took off uh, around that time in the 50s and in a more uh, concrete manner in the 1960s when we launched our first uh, Indian technical and economic cooperation program. Uh, coming to South-South cooperation, it is about a partnership um, among equals based on solidarity, respect for national sovereignty, and ownership. And what makes South-South very distinct from the OECD DAC or North-South collaboration is that it is free from conditionality. Uh, it does not impose, it is demand-driven, it is at the request of recipients, and this is something which makes it very unique. We do not tell countries as to what they should be doing. We ask them as to what they want, or if they approach us uh, with any assistance that is readily provided. Uh, another very interesting aspect of South-South cooperation, which, which cannot be, because by the nature of it, cannot be part of uh, the way we have OECD DAC uh, uh, functioning on development cooperation, is because of the proximity of development experiences that developing countries have. You know, level of technology is similar, the kind of training is similar, the level of industrialization is similar, the level of development process that uh, they have all gone through is similar. They all, all developing countries had to deal with uh, challenges of uh, poverty, underdevelopment, lack of roads, etc. in the 1950s, 60s. So this made this whole South-South cooperation exercise very unique uh, and reinforcing the idea of, of uh, shared, uh, uh, shared values and solidarity. Now coming to, uh, uh, we had a conference in 2009 in Nairobi and that Nairobi document and Nairobi understanding is the reference point for South-South cooperation. We had all 193 countries participating there, and that is how we see that the discussion and discourse, global discourse and discussion on South-South must be referenced and must be based on the outcome of, uh, of Nairobi of 2009. Any other, any other processes that we've had, including Busan, must be subsumed under the understanding of uh, Nairobi. And in fact, even Busan, if you would see, paragraph two says very clearly, and I would read, the principles and commitments and actions agreed in the outcome document, that is Busan, shall be the reference for South-South partners on a voluntary basis. So this is very important to keep in mind because we are talking of two distinct identities. And both the identities need as much space as we can give so that they can all grow and contribute to development cooperation, to, ex to eradicating extreme poverty, which, see, which we see is, is uh, gaining a lot of currency, uh, of, to eradicate poverty with a, with, within a timeline uh, is that uh, what countries, what partners, what communities, and what all organizations world over are saying as we are, we are preparing ourselves for post-2015 development agenda. Uh, coming to India's own South-South program, uh, we started off in the 1950s. In 1964, we launched our Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. Today, of course, it has, uh, it has grown in size. Uh, and our strategy, uh, which is very unique to us, is fundamentally was and is based on capacity building. Now, capacity building happens to be the base of our technical and economic cooperation program. Uh, it, is, it is low cost but high value because you train more people and then uh, they add more value to th their own societies. Today, we are partnering 161 countries, mostly in uh, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. But there are some, some other countries also in Europe where, uh, where this assistance is provided. In the year 2012, we had 900 trainees uh, given undertaking uh, various sorts of um, uh, undergoing training programs in India. We also extended some 2,300 uh, uh, scholarships for courses at universities. Uh, and we also ran a lot of special courses at the request of countries on question on issues on uh, themes like election management, WTO studies, uh, parliamentary practices, public-private partnerships, and many more. Um, apart from Indian technical and economic cooperation, we also have two more programs which form an important aspect of our, technia, of our uh, capacity building development cooperation exercise. Uh, one is, the second one is special 
Commonwealth Assistance for Africa program, which is CAP, and the Technical Cooperation Scheme of Colombo Plan. Uh, among our, among our uh, capacity building exercise, uh, the most flagship program that we have been able to do is the Pan-African E-Network, which connects all 54 or 53 countries of Africa with centers of excellence of health and education in India. Uh, through this program, country, a uh, person sitting in a village or a small town in Senegal or anywhere else can access the best of health, telemedicine facilities or health services in any institute of excellence in India. We also have something like some, I don't, may, maybe I'm getting the figure, uh, I don't have the figure right now, but it's in thousands, some 20,000 students are also undergoing university education and online courses through this Pan-African e-network. Building on this, we also, in 2011, we announced creating a virtual university linking uh, the continent of Africa with, a, with India, where uh, it will provide uh, courses to some 20,000 students over a period of uh, several years. So uh, we are looking forward to that. Also in 2011, we announced creating 100 institutions in Africa, which can be uh, on various issues of food, textiles, rural development, uh, weather forecasting, uh, given the fact that food security remains a key question. There are 22 of the 33 LDC countries in Africa. Uh, they are permanently in a state of food insecurity. The food uh, question of food security is very important, and given this requirement of that continent, we feel that uh, we should do more in terms of capacity building uh, by way of a technical program. Uh, also very interesting, we have this program called Solar Grandmothers. We get illiterate uh, women from uh, villages in Africa. They are trained in India to how to manage solar electrification small plants. Uh, and this is a big, big success, uh, this program. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to how to scale it up. Uh, we also, in the past, just to give you a diversity of our, of our engagement, in the past, we, were, we are very thankful to the United States for our own green revolution, which uh, has allowed us in the 1960s, since the 1960s, to feed us. USAID has been in the forefront for that, and we are very thankful. We also, while getting this benefit, we also extended uh, similar, uh, similar experiences with Vietnam, and today Vietnam is a net exporter uh, far outpacing in India far outpacing India in, in, ter in, in terms of rice cultivation. Uh, so just to give you an idea of our structure and diversity of our cooperation, which perhaps may not have many parallels in other, uh, other forms of uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, and in fact, uh, as a, as a uh, looking at these values that we have been able to provide, donor countries and agencies and multilateral development banks, multilateral development organizations today are building new social, building their own plans, uh, development programs and training based in the Indian experience, and they want to locate, also want to locate in India. Uh, in our, uh, our development assistance in the, in the last two decades, uh, a little more has broadened from just uh, capacity building also to include grants, concessional loans, and uh, lines of credit. We have uh, currently 150 lines of credit running, which has been able to spur growth, trade, inclusive growth, uh, economic activity, create employment in recipient countries. Uh, we, they have also contributed significantly to meeting the Millennium Development Goals, where we are financing drinking water projects, we are financing irrigation projects, solar electrification power plants, so on and so forth. Uh, currently, we have uh, uh, we are disbursing lines of credit worth 9.5 billion. This is in the last 10 years. Uh, most of it, around 60 percent of it, goes to the African countries. Uh, we also have 500 projects under execution presently in various parts of the world under our uh, economic, technical and economic cooperation. Our uh, development projects in the, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood is based on grant, as grant assistance where we are trying to build on connectivities, rural infrastructure, so as to allow a greater degree of economic uh, integration with, uh, within South Asia. Uh, since, since we're running short of time, I'll just uh, mention about, uh, we all understand that South-South, the salience of South-South is increasing. Now this increase in salience of South-South must reflect itself in the way South-South is seen in terms of governance and decision-making. We need greater support for South-South cooperation by the 
by the there must be a greater support for for south south cooperation by the international financial institutions the the successes of south south must be replicated there must be greater support by world bank for example by uh, regional development banks so on so forth even within the united nations it must have uh, the the southern template must must be given greater say in terms of uh, development agenda setting which presently it lacks woefully lacks uh, with this i will leave it and perhaps we can discuss more uh, during the question and answer time thank you Th thank you very much uh, mr jaswal for not only a fine presentation about india's uh, growing development cooperation and its long history on south south cooperation going back to the 1950s but also the uh, the, the points you made about the, the, the origins, the purposes, and, and the special attributes of South-South cooperation more, more, more broadly. Uh, next, I'd like to, to call on Ms. Uh, Siti Nugraha Muludia, who is the uh, Director for Technical Cooperation in Indonesia's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, Ibu Siti. Thank you, Pat Gordon. <coughs> uh, first of all, I would like to express our gratitude for the to the Asia Foundation and the USAID for organizing this event and uh, to enable us to share where we are and where are we going uh, with the South-South cooperation. Um, I've prepared uh, some slides here, but I would skip some because uh, I, I, we were just we are just given only 15, 10 minutes. So uh, this is going to flag me with the red and uh, blue and yellow cards. So I have to be really um, well. I'm not going to go to the current global situation. We know uh, where wh what we are and South-South cooperation are the complement of the South-South and Triangle cooperation is complement for the North-South co uh, cooperation. It's not substitute, but it's complement. And uh, currently, uh, middle-income countries such as Indonesia is playing a bigger role on the South-South cooperation framework. Uh, in, 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 in terms of scaling up uh, knowledge sharing activities uh, through North-South and uh, South-South and Triangle cooperation. Uh, we have uh, three development, uh, uh, identified three de development cooperation pillars. Uh, first, on investment leverage uh, to support financing of development programs, optimizing utilization of sources and schemes of development finance, uh, financing, and focusing on uh, loan utilization infrastructure and energy. And uh, the second pillar is capacity building, uh, development of human resources and institutions, uh, policy development, and increasing competitiveness of, of goods and services. And of course, the third p p pillar is, um, um, is also on uh, international cooperation, where it's also called co uh, triangle cooperation, and also in supporting Indonesia's uh, role in international fora, um, for example, in G20 and global partnership. Uh, Indonesia is a provider country. We started in in, eight, in the 80s, but it's mainly because our constitution. Uh, it stated it, we are mandated uh, to contribute to global welfare and world uh, peace. So it's 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 we are mandated by our, our constitution, and um, now we are moving toward a global partnership. At the moment, uh, we are calculating the Indonesia's contribution from 2000 to 2013. Next slide, please. It's um, about. Um, almost for 50 million U.S. dollars. It's it's minuscule. It's nothing compared to Korea or Japan or uh, United States. Uh, but it's you know it's this might be a tip of the iceberg because we have a lot of uh, programs that are not documented uh, because the implementing agencies are not only the the the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs or uh, but also other ministries, the line ministries, uh, the, and sectors covered. Uh, in agriculture, uh, and um, uh, disaster risk management, maternal and child health, and, and so on. Um, uh, what are we doing now? Uh, we are actually now, we are uh, finalizing the grand design and blueprint for Indonesia South-South cooperation. Um, well, I said we are still finalizing because we started in 2011. Um, just to give you an example of how, you know, how, 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 uh, how intricate it is for us, so that we, we really uh, are doing it in careful uh, manner. Uh, and in the first uh, stage, uh, we want to build a stronger coordination within the revitalized uh, institutional framework. Um, at the second stage, uh, from the fifth to 2015 to 2019, uh, we want to, uh, to, to identify new emerging partner 
in innovative South-South and Triangle Cooperation for Development. And the last stage uh, until the 2020, uh, we will build stronger partnership between innovative and inclusive South-South cooperation. And the framework for South-South cooperation, South-South and Triangle Cooperation of Indonesia, um, we have the, the, the pillars, the three pillars, and, um, and for this we are formulating and assessing issues, modalities, partners, funding, framework, and uh, combined of current issues and flagship program that we, are, uh, we have identified, um, we, we, we identified some of the flagship uh, programs. I'll go uh, in detail later. And the modalities is South-South Cooperation Triangle Cooperation. Uh, partners is government, uh, development partners, partner country, private sectors, uh, civil socia society organization, philanthropy, and other, other stakeholders. And funding, fra funding framework, uh, it, 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 it has several, um, several actors too. And uh, then implementation. And the funding itself, on the um, uh, initial South-South and Triangle Cooperation, we have our own national budget and a bilateral cooperation in terms, this is a triangular cooperation with the donor country, donor partners, and then multilateral cooperation and public-private par partnership. Um, we have identified Indonesia's flagship program. This is, uh, we are identifying this based on sectors that, uh, program that have been requested a lot. Because our principle in doing a South-South and Triangle cooperation is uh, demand driven. If there is no demand, we are, we are not supplying anything that, that the, 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 the beneficiary countries the need. And so uh, demand driven and sharing experiences are the principles of our South-South cooperation program. And the flagship program, there are 10 flagship program that we have identified. Um, but um, last year, we are organizing, uh, together with JICA, World Bank, and um, UNDP, we are organizing the South-South Cooperation on high-level meeting on uh, country-led knowledge hub in July 2012. And on that meeting, uh, we declared, uh, our vice president announced that Indonesia are ready to be a knowledge hub for three uh, main sectors. Uh, first is on... Um, Poverty alleviation and development, uh, disaster management and climate change. Could you remember? Yes, the next slide, please. And on good governance and peace building, uh, mainly on democracy, law enforcement, and peacekeeping. And then on macroeconomic management and public finance and microfinance. This is the the the, the three uh, um, identified sectors that we are ready as a knowledge hub. And at the moment, we don't have yet uh, in, in the central agencies in Indonesia like JICA or USAID or COICA, but we are now at the moment in, 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 a, in, a, in a, a, a scheme of a national coordinating team. And uh, the national coordinating team uh, con comprised of four ministries, in, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of uh, National uh, Planning, um, Ministry of uh, Finance and State Secretariat. Um, and the next slide, the slide, um, this is the role and function of the line ministry in terms of the South-South and Triangular Cooperation. Uh, this is Minister of Foreign Affairs as the, uh, you know, the we, they def we define, because I'm from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the foreign policy and diplomacy, the, the framework itself. And then the, um, the BAPANAS is the national agencies for uh, planning. Uh, they dis they, they, they uh, identify the national priority and development cooperation and budgeting. And uh, the finance ministry is uh, on decided on fiscal policy and state budget. And the support and facilitation are done by the state secretariat. And the implementing agencies <coughs> are line ministries, local government, private sectors, NGOs. And all are coordinated by this national coordinating team. Um, so there we are, where we are. And we are moving forward now. Um, at the moment, we have we are um, uh, identifying, we are implementing some triangular cooperation, and at the same time, we are also in, uh, getting a lot of requests for in, uh, uh, new triangular cooperation for for don from donor partners. Um, and our principles of triangular cooperation first is to ensure effectiveness. Uh, the triangular cooperation will be based on demand driven from the beneficiary sides. Uh, and of course, it has to be in line with the national policy of the beneficiary countries. And programs should be carried out in a sustainable and, and, and in, ter in terms of benefit as well as sustainable in terms of effort. So this is this is the to, to ensure effectiveness and to in, in, in enhance uh, transparency. The consultation we should be done among all parties, not only the the, the us, the provider of the capacity, the donor country, as well as the beneficiary countries. Um, so we have to to discuss this prior to in the implementation, starting from the planning itself. And this, this 
you know, hopefully would result in a more effective program and building trust among all the, the, the parties involved. And, and the triangular cooperation, we are also in fighting uh, public, uh, uh, we, there's also public, pu pu public private partnership um, in order to, 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 to uh, address the critical gaps of, uh, in development assistance. Um, so we need to secure the involvement of the private sectors, not only uh, private sectors in, in, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, um, provider countries uh, to, to, uh, to leverage their interest in the beneficiary countries, but as well as the pr uh, private sectors in the beneficiary countries to, uh, to ensure sustainability of the, of the impact. We have the standard of uh, operating pro procedure for triangular cooperation. This is very intricate. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through on that, but the current, our current priorities on the uh, uh, triangular cooperation, south-south uh, cooperation and triangular cooperation is implementing strategic cooperation with partner countries through pilot uh, activities, uh, such as in education, uh, planning and budgeting, agriculture, poverty reduction, disaster management, democracy and, and justice, as well as enhancing capacity of the uh, national coordinating team. So uh, we are, uh, we are um, in terms of uh, uh, volume and uh, programs, we are still, um, uh, you know, uh, small uh, compared to uh, India or uh, China and, uh, or Brazil or uh, some other middle income countries who's, who's, who's been also uh, having a dual role in, in this uh, South-South cooperation. But uh, we are, um, um, increasing our uh, program and and we are hoping that you know uh, donor countries and donor partners uh, partners of the development countries could could uh, come forward and join us because we we'll receive i receive a lot of requests i uh, ambassadors from recipient uh, you know potential uh, beneficial countries keep coming to my office and they they come with all the list of requests and almost all sectors and i was just sometimes i was amazed that you know the the recognition of our capacity from those countries sometimes we we don't realize that we don't we have capacity on that sector until somebody asks uh, to us and so um, we are we are we are, we are hoping this triangular cooperation could could also look into into our list of uh, needs that uh, we we developed and there are still more that hasn't been fulfilled by by, by our own resources uh, so that we could uh, we could um, uh, help uh, the the beneficiaries countries to get what they they need uh, from uh, you know get benefits from the sharing of experience of the capacity that Indonesia needs um, Wow, I'm still yellow uh, card. So, but I'm, I, I will leave uh, uh, the, my presentation on that, and maybe we could uh, discuss more during this discussion or during the lunch. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ibu Siti. It's true there is such widespread interest uh, throughout the region and really around around the world in, in learning from from Indonesia's extraordinary success and development and democratization in a, in a country of such extraordinary uh, ethnic and religious diversity. And it's, it's uh, wonderful that, that Indonesia is, is being so generous in sharing its, its experience. Uh, finally, uh, on our panel, we're going to hear from uh, Kichiro Nakazawa. Uh, he is the chief representative of the Japan International Cooperation Bureau of, of uh, Agency of, of JICA. Uh, here in the United States. Uh, Mr. Nakazawa. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, good morning to you. It's uh, really my pleasure to be here with you today, and I thank uh, Asian Foundation, USAID, and other co-organizers uh, of this event uh, to invite me. So I'd like to start my presentation today with this table. Uh, this table shows Japan's net ODA loans, uh, and this, uh, you know, I prepared to show Asian partners rise. You know, if you look at this table, first, you know, Republican, uh, Republic of Korea. You know, South Korea, uh, Japan signed its last loan agreement uh, in 1990 and completed its loan disbursement a few years later. And since then, uh, South Korea has been repaying its debt to Japan, and it is set to complete its repayment in the near future. And look at China. China used to be the uh, biggest recipients of Japanese ODA loans. However, after the last ODA loan agreement was signed with China in 2007, repayments from China have gradually exceeded the disbursement to China. 
And in fiscal year 2011, we received a remarkable 933 million US dollars of repayments from China, uh, more than uh, our disbursement. Indonesia is uh, still, uh, you know, lending operation is going on, but repayment has become bigger than disbursement. And as of 2011, you know, only India and Vietnam, among these five countries, borrow more from Japan than repay to Japan. And as a result, you know, JICA owed their own disbursement to Asia was smaller than repayment amounts from Asia in fiscal year 2011 making Japan's net OD loans to Asia negative 392 million US dollars. From these statistics, you know, it's very clear to see that our Asian partners are really rising and can gradually mobilize domestic and private resources. We are very much proud of our partner country's successful economic development and our contribution so far. As explained by uh, my previous speakers, many Asian countries are emerging as big actors extending development cooperation to other countries. It's not uncommon for countries to uh, be aid recipients and aid providers simultaneously. Look at Japan. You know, Japan signed its last loan agreement with the World Bank in 1965. But Japan had extended economic cooperation to Asian partners since 1954 when uh, we joined the so-called Colombo Plan. And it wasn't until 1990 that Japan completed uh, its repayment to the World Bank. At that time, Japan was a top donor. Therefore, it seems very, un very natural that many Asian countries have studied and extended the, uh, their development cooperation to other partner countries. So today, I will not talk about big infrastructure projects Japan finances or climate change uh, mitigation projects we support. But rather, I will focus upon how we work with other Asian countries. First, I will speak about the Asian Development Forum. Then I will discuss South-South cooperation and triangular type of cooperation. The Asian Development uh, Forum was established in 2010 since then, four annual forums have been held uh, with themes such as uh, experiences of Asian economic development and roles of ODA, ODA and green growth in Asia, Asian input toward post-2015 development agenda, and the post pusam Global Partnership. Ten Asian countries and the three international development organizations participated at the last forum held in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, last March. Next, please. And let me share some of the details of the discussions uh, at the various Asian development forums. Participants have discussed Asian experiences of rapid economic transformation and ODA's contribution. As factors behind this rapid, rapid development, they argued the importance of, one, an open trading system and outward-looking policies. Two, discipline in macroeconomic policy. Three, institutional strengths, including an efficient, capable government sector. Four, giving a high priority to education. Five, country ownership in development policy, as common threats, among others. As for the role of ODA, Participants argued that ODA contributed crucially to Asia's development. ODA supported infrastructure development, capacity development, and technology transfer. Thus improved business environment, promoted direct investment and private sector development, and brought about broad-based economic development and poverty reduction. At these meetings, uh, participants have discussed remaining and new challenges faced by Asian countries as well. As for the middle income trap, the participants emphasized that, one, countries should give priority to the role of technological innovation and should accumulate human resources that meet market needs. Two, countries should take advantage of PPPs and other means to strengthen investment so that they can avoid the bottlenecks caused by infrastructure shortages. 
and three, uh, countries should enhance the productivity of local small and medium-sized enterprises and integrate them into regional production and distribution networks. Regarding the role of Asia in development assistance community, many argue that Asian countries can take advantage of their positions as developing countries and aid providers to share their experiences. They specifically suggested that Asia could provide useful lessons to inform African development, particularly on infrastructure development, technical assistance for agriculture, and on the ground training for industrial cluster development. Although I cannot explain all the conversations from the forums, I believe that having continuous and rich dialogue among Asian nations has benefited not only the participants, but it will also promote or uh, have positive impacts on future Asian development cooperation. Let me then touch upon South South cooperation and triangular cooperation. Many Asian countries, as my previous speakers noted, uh, have provided economic cooperation for quite some time. The UN General Assembly formed the Working Group on Technical Cooperation among Developing Countries in 1972, and Japan has extended triangular cooperation since 1975. However, it's very recent that the international community has fully recognized the and, 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 and endorsed uh, South South cooperation and triangular cooperation. Both the G20 multi year action plan on development and the fourth high level forum uh, on aid effectiveness held in Busan, uh, South Korea, highlighted the importance of South South cooperation and triangular cooperation for knowledge sharing and mutual learning. South South cooperation has uh, potential, if I use a phrase that uh, appeared in the Pusan uh, outcome document, to transform developing countries' policies and approaches to service delivery by bringing effective locally owned solutions that are appropriate to country contexts. However, we also have to recognize the fact that the organization of South South cooperation or triangular cooperation often lacks institutions and mechanisms to scale up development results. And it often suffers from high transaction costs, fragmentation, small scale, and limited impact. So in order to overcome such uh, constraints of South South, South South cooperation and triangular cooperation, a structured and systematic approach is very much necessary. So we at JICA introduced partnership program framework between Japan and uh, emerging aid providers to jointly implement uh, triangular cooperation for beneficiary countries and to share knowledge and experiences on aid management. Under the partnership program, JICA, in collaboration with a uh, uh, pivotal partner country, holds regular consultation to plan joint activities, dispatching development experts from both countries to other developing partner countries, and jointly conduct training programs. To date, uh, Japan has concluded this partnership program with 12 countries, out of which four Asian countries, as you can see uh, on this slide. For example, we agreed Japan-Indonesia partnership program in December 2003. Under this program, establishing microfinance institutions in Africa is one of the major cooperation areas. Let me finally introduce uh, the Asia-Pacific Development Center on Disability, or APCD, in Thailand as an example of JICA's South South Cooperation and Triangular Cooperation. The APCD has facilitated collaboration among organizations of persons with disabilities in 37 countries uh, in the Asia-Pacific region and promoted their empowerment as part of an inclusive, barrier-free, and rights-based society. JICA provided technical cooperation to Thailand for this APCD between 2002 and 2012 including the dispatch of Japanese experts who themselves were intellectually disabled. At the workshop in Thailand, 
uh, they told audiences about their experiences in networking and establishing a self-help group for intellectually disabled in Japan. And they helped Thai counterparts to establish Thai's first ever self-help group for intellectually disabled named Daoran. Then a short time later, Thai leaders of Daoran shared their experiences and supported the establishment of the first ever self-help groups for persons with dis uh, intellectual disabilities in Myanmar and in Cambodia. A good story, isn't it? So let me conclude. In 1970s and 80s, the international community was surprised by the economic rise of Japan. In 93, the World Bank published uh, the East, economic, no, sorry, East Asian miracle and praised high performing Asian economies, which included the four Asian tigers, as well as Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Japan. After the turn of the century, people again realized that more and more Asian countries are on the rise. China, as you know, accounted for 680 million people moving out of extreme poverty between 1981 and 2010, 680 million. That's more than twice the size of the United States population. So I believe there are a lot of things that Asian can tell to the world about their experiences with rapid growth accompanied by poverty reduction. In a world where ending extreme poverty has become the goal, Asian countries can contribute not only by uh, continuing their efforts to eradicate their poverty, but also by extending development cooperation to others. This should be our goal as we move forward, and Asian can make a difference, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nakazawa-san. And we have about, uh, and, and, and particularly the, the way you, you ran through the different historical phases of Japan's cooperation in the region and the current attention to Japan's role in facilitating South-South uh, cooperation. I think very, very interesting. We have about 20 minutes uh, for uh, questions and answers uh, from, from the floor, so I would encourage you to stick your hand up, and we have people who will bring you a, a microphone. And please uh, state your, your name and affiliation uh, uh, when, when you ask your, your question. All right, thank you. Uh, there, this in the back. Yes, you, sir. Um, Tom Timberg, the consultant. Um, I wondered if you, anyone on the pattern, panel, but it's particularly the Indian speaker, I think, who's relevant, could talk about the role of Indian and more general Asian private businesses in terms of technical cooperation. I'm conscious of the fact that India is now a major exporter of education and health services and education and health support services to Africa. And um, I'm wondering to what extent those are coordinated with the uh, various technical cooperation things. I'm sure, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are such uh, exports and uh, certainly there's an active private sector in every one of the other countries concern that's very involved in African Latin America. Um, so perhaps people could refer more generally to the coordination between private sector involvement for profit, private sector involvement, mm -hmm. and the technical cooperation programs. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Jeswat, do you want to? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, development landscape has changed. Apart from governments, private sector, philanthropic organizations, private foundations are equally playing uh, an important role. The Indian private sector is no different. We have uh, our private sector presence in, uh, in Africa in the last decades has uh, increased significantly. It has, it has uh, had an impact on development on core development challenges, including Millennium Development Goals. You would uh, appreciate that the participation of Indian telecom companies in Africa has significantly brought down the rates of telecom services from uh, a high of, 
It was one of the highest rates. Africa, you had the highest rates because it was a monopoly market. Today, it is the most competitive uh, market when it comes to telecommunications. The coming down, the, 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 the affordability of telecommunication facilities has had a huge impact across, sweeping impact across Africa, in villages, in, in towns and cities, everywhere you go. And through these, because of this affordability factor, people have now are able to uh, able to access many of the services, health services via via mobile phones. They're able to uh, access uh, uh, many of the banking facilities th uh, through through uh, banking uh, through mobile uh, mobile telephony. Uh, now, uh, may not uh, many of you may not appreciate what happened the Supreme Court judgment of India regarding Novartis case, but you would all realize that had it not been for the Indian pharmaceutical companies, the HIV strategy, the world's HIV strategy, including United States PEPFAR program, would not have taken off. You know, the, the difference between what Novartis, for example, just giving you the case of uh, Novartis because it's very recent in our memories, the difference between profit, I mean, the, the Indian generic product Val was valued could be uh, was valued at say 700 800 dollars for a treatment over a year similar f sim for similar drugs from novartis you had to pay 85000 dollars so you know the scale of it is such that you have to do something especially at a time when we are all talking of global responsibilities we have to balance uh, uh, rewards for innovators with some sort of uh, uh, understanding of what public good is. So in that sense, you know, Indian pharmaceutical companies have, con have contributed significantly to uh, the achievement of development goals. Now the question of as to how it is, how it is uh, also, um, uh, how is private sector involved in our own technical co uh, cooperation programs, or how is government also taking lead uh, in, in in uh, taking advantage of private sector, we have uh, we have extended a lot of uh, lines of credit which are available to the private sector as seed capital or to catalyze um, or leverage more financing for them to uh, invest more in reaching out to new new uh, new markets and new countries where they can uh, sub significantly play an important role in, in spurring development. Thank you. Before we move on, I'm wondering if other panelists would like to, to say a bit about this this uh, issue of the role of private sector in the overall development cooperation programs. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in, in our case, um, because you are asking how we coordinated, I mean like the government coordinate with the private sector. Uh, to tell you the truth, we are just starting it. Uh, they've been doing some on their own without our help. Uh, but now we are trying to put it into our grand design on how we are going to, to do it in a, in a, in a, a more uh, structural uh, 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 way. Um, we, are, we are just still finding, uh, you know, we, we just started it. Um, we are doing some seminars on how we are going to do it, but there are a lot, lots of um, uh, interest from private sectors, and uh, they mostly they, they don't know that the government is or already a provider. They think we are just net importer of the capacity building or technical cooperation or development assistance, but we are now giving out, and they, they, they just realize it. So now we are just starting uh, conference the conversation. We are having uh, seminars on, on uh, how we are going to do it and involving the embassies and um, the, the private sectors in, in in, 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 in Indonesia itself. So um, we're just starting, and then we are actually uh, hoping that we could learn from uh, from the, the, the traditional donors on how they are doing it, because uh, we realized that you know we could be, the government could be or the, uh, the, the the capacity building could be a catalyst for, uh, to provide a conducive environment for the business uh, sectors in, in the recipient countries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Park. Yes, uh, uh, Korea also trying uh, to engage the private sectors in our development cooperation. Uh, we launched the alliance uh, uh, where the NGOs uh, as well as uh, private sectors. Uh, uh, one example we are doing is, uh, well, you know, Hyundai uh, Automobile Company, they have a business in many countries, uh, and uh, to make their business more sustainable and more profitable, they need uh, very trained uh, auto repair mechanics. Uh, then we integrate this in business need uh, into our vocational training program for the local people. 
So when we est uh, establish vocal training, uh, vocational training center, we open a course on uh, auto uh, service uh, uh, training. Uh, then uh, Hyundai company also provide uh, uh, teachers. Um, it's a kind of a PPP. Uh, it's it's very uh, good. They're serving uh, uh, to uh, well develop cooperation uh, purposes as well as business purposes uh, by um, having skilled uh, people. Uh, can that company can uh, secure uh, the the uh, skilled people uh, supply? Uh, while uh, they are also contributing to job creation, and income generation, and capacity building, um, and uh, uh, eradication of poverty. So it uh, serves uh, both develop cooperation objectives and uh, business uh, interest. That's an example we are doing. Okay, next question. Yes, here in the front. Thank you. I'm Teresita Schaefer, trustee of the Asia Foundation. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, each of the uh, speakers how you measure success. You have different models, actually, for each of your, uh, your uh, development support programs. What will make you feel that you have succeeded in your goal, either in an individual program or in the program as a whole? All right. <laughs> who, who would like to... Uh Take that one on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, to, be, you know, to be frank, I'm quite happy today, you know, uh, together with uh, our Asian partners, which, you know, now can uh, extend a lot of, uh, you know, economic cooperation or, uh, in many sectors. You know, unless, uh, you know, our Asian partners have been successful in their development, you know, they are not, you know, able to provide uh, or extend the cooperation to other countries. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, we provide a lot of assistance to, uh, you know, neighboring Asian, you know, Asian countries. And, uh, you know, the rise of Asian countries and the, probably the decrease of the Japanese uh, net ODA to uh, Asian countries itself uh, shows kind of success uh, of our development of cooperation so far. Mm -hmm. Good. Ms. Park? Well, uh, I, uh, if we have a representative for uh, COICA here, then uh, they, can, uh, they can make a better explanation how they evaluate uh, the impact of their, their project. And I'm pretty sure that the COICA um, has a very good uh, impact evaluation processes. Uh, what I understand is when they design the program at the very uh, beginning stage, uh, they uh, uh, identify the expected uh, outcomes. So according to those, uh, uh, well, they have they set some criteria as how to evaluate the success of the program. Uh, then uh, they will uh, after the completion uh, of uh, the project that they will make evaluation, very thorough evaluation, uh, how, how much impact they made uh, on the ground. But I don't have details here with me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in our case, uh, we have a guideline for evaluation and, um, and also to uh, measure the impacts. But unfortunately, <coughs> what we have been doing mostly is one-off training program. And there has been some uh, requests uh, for Indonesia to, to do beyond training program. And uh, we need uh, to build our own capacity as a provider to do that because it's it's, it's more complex uh, uh, kind of program rather than the one-off uh, training program. Uh, but on, on the measure, measuring itself uh, on the one-off training program, usually we do uh, uh, rent random um, uh, visit to our uh, uh, former participants and and have an interview and how they uh, whether in in their professional um, uh, or in uh, you know in, in professional um, what is it uh, occupation they gain something for instance we have uh, we ha we once we had a training for um, multimedia uh, in, in multimedia and then we visited some of the uh, some of the participants and uh, some of them had um, get a, what is it, a, a promotion. Uh, for instance, uh, 
in multimedia in television at the time. And then one uh, first, uh, he came as a programmer, and then after the, he get our training, now he's a, a, a director. Uh, for uh, for the program, so I think that it, it's very um, a basic measurement. But we have we we have uh, the guideline, and we we need to do it more in a mechanical uh, and then structured way. Uh, but um, and um, I think you know sometimes we just measure from the requests that keep coming to us, and especially on one specific sectors. And then some even come to for the for the next stage of that kind of training, and and then we have a lot of case on that. Thank you very much. But again, we need to have a really uh, um, uh, uh, a mechanism on, on measure impacts, especially because you know like it's 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 more important uh, on that. Thank you. Thank you. Very briefly, we are have we also have our own ways of uh, measuring and evaluation of our programs and the huge uh, value addition that our training programs have brought uh, to the host societies in terms of rural development productive capacity building, uh, socioeconomic advances itself is a big measure of how far we've moved ahead. Uh, uh, I will leave it at that for the time being. Thank you. Okay, we have time for, for one more question. Yes. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alina Zhushkovsky. I'm with the Global Development Network, and uh, thank you very much for organizing this event. It was, it was very um, interesting. Um, Global Development Network is an uh, organization that uh, builds research capacity for researchers in developing countries. So uh, for that reason, um, we are based in New Delhi, We work, but we work globally. Uh, and uh, we certainly uh, would be interested in knowing what kind of work uh, you all are doing with development researchers in particular. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also have, uh, we have a friend here, Sachin, Chaturvedi from RIS in New Delhi. So perhaps, uh, you know, we also engage with the larger community, their development community, in terms of approaches, what are new ideas, and how we can take them forward. Um, we, uh, we have a regular interaction, and we also, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of structured uh, leads that we uh, take on research, um, I would say that uh, uh, RIS is one organization just to give you an example, that uh, that is engaged uh, on the issue of development cooperation. Thank you. Uh, you know, I don't recall any of our uh, uh, program on research so far. I mean, like uh, my uh, our division has just been created 2006, and then before that, all the ministries are doing well. It, even still now, they are still are doing doing it, but. I have to check with our um, uh, LIPI, what is it, the, the research uh, center, Res science centers. Yeah. I'm sure you know some of our research center has been doing it, but it's not yet been documented. As I mentioned earlier, when I mentioned about the volume of the our uh, our uh, cooperation, it's just a tip of iceberg because there are so many things that so 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 many programs that has that not been uh, uh, put in in the databases because of the lack of the data itself. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, I mean, research is, uh, regarding development cooperation. I'm quite uh, sure that the KDI has a long list uh, of uh, uh, researches. Uh, currently, our foreign ministry uh, are doing some researches uh, um, on uh, policy coherence. And as I uh, mentioned in my presentation, one of the tasks uh, to upgrade uh, to improve our ODA quality, we need more policy coherence uh, uh, within our government. So we are doing uh, conducting policy coherence uh, uh, research. And uh, the second one is post-2015 implementation mechanism. Uh, and, and in MDG, we found that uh, it lacks uh, a very systematic implementation mechanism. So when uh, we want to make post-2015 more successful, then we need a very well-designed uh, implementation mechanism. So we are doing uh, some research on that, especially uh, how to, uh, uh, to put the other 
global forum like uh, uh, G20 and uh, Busan Global Partnership will be placed under uh, post-2015 uh, framework. Um, the, uh, the other uh, one uh, we are uh, doing is uh, on uh, financing for development. Uh, um, as you know, the, the portion of ODA in, uh, in development uh, resources floor is getting smaller and smaller. And the, the role of a private uh, grant and uh, non-official floor is like uh, uh, FDI uh, and export guarantee uh, and uh, the, the other forms of uh, finance uh, will play more role than how uh, to, to, to monitor and trace uh, the, those uh, uh, finance flows and how to make ODA uh, more effective uh, as a catalyst uh, to uh, generate uh, other resources for development. So those are the, some uh, items uh, we are doing uh, some research. So thank you. Uh, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, JICA has a research institute uh, working on several uh, important projects. Uh, you know, Asian experience in development and uh, the role of you know ODA play. You know, the role played by ODA is one of the big topic. But if I pick up some, uh, you know, research topics which are now going on with the American institutions, uh, the one is uh, with the Brookings Institution, we studied about the Arab Spring. And also, uh, we have recently completed our work with Brookings on the scaling up of uh, development results. And I think launching event will be uh, sometime in uh, June or July uh, in Washington, D.C. as well. And lastly, uh, but not least, uh, with the Columbia University's IPD uh, Initiative for Policy Dialogue, which uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, is reading, uh, we study the African development. And also there, uh, we also study how uh, African countries can utilize the experiences of Asian countries. Thank you. I think in, 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 in all of the Asian countries, that there is a, a more attention to research not only within the government agencies involved with international development cooperation, but there's also a growing uh, network of, of, of support in the sense of, of academic institutions and think tanks and, and scholars and networks of scholars that are that are involved in, 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 in this type of research and also informing the work of, of government uh, agencies. Uh, Dr. Li Xiaoyun from China Agriculture University, for example, who's on the next panel, he's involved in establishing a network of, of, of uh, researchers inside China working on development cooperation. So I think this is happening uh, throughout the region, these types of initiatives. Let me mention one thing. Please. Uh, you know, let me announce uh, with my pleasure that recently, uh, you know, David Arnold, uh, president of the Asia Foundation, uh, visited Japan uh, and visited JICA, met uh, with our president, uh, Dr. Akihiko Tanaka. And the Asian Foundation and JICA uh, signed memorandum of understanding uh, for the development effectiveness. So uh, we are very much looking forward to working with the Asian Foundation for the uh, important research project as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, we are almost on time, and I want to uh, thank all of our, our panelists for their, their excellent presentations, and, and they all stayed within the, the strict time limits of our timekeeper. And, and, and thank you uh, for the, uh, your, your uh, excellent questions and, and, and your uh, attentive participation in this, uh, in, in this panel. So thank you all. And we are adjourned. Uh, we will meet. We will reconvene promptly at 1045. So, so let's have a, a coffee break.